Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm John Dowling, the Assistant Chair of the Textile Surface Design Department, and I welcome you all to FIT for this presentation. Uh, it's actually a book launch, and it's for uh, a designer that I'm very, very proud to introduce to you today. Um, Ms. Kim Parker is an internationally acclaimed textile designer and artist. She's the winner of three British Design Awards, the Design and Decoration Award, the L Decoration UK Award and the Observer Magazine Award for Best in Flooring Design in the UK. So she has some ties to the UK that we're going to explore a little bit. Uh, with her uniquely floral designer rug, Mums and Asters, for the Rug Company, which is pretty prominently displayed here in front of us. Um, and this was my first Kim Parker experience, actually, this carpet back in 2004 at the Rug Company. And I didn't know who designed it, but now I do. Um, the Kim Parker Home brand was launched in 2001 and includes uh, a lifestyle range of designer rugs, dinnerware, giftware, bedding, bath, fabrics, decorative pillows, stationery, and wall art. In October 2006, the designer introduced her new dinnerware and giftware collections with Spode at the Tabletop Market Week in New York. In April 2007, Kim Parker Home by Spode Tableware launched at the Macy's Flower Show at Herald Square in New York City. Um, her award-winning designer rug collection is re represented by the UK's premier flooring label, The Rug Company, which is in Soho, as many of you know, and is sold in New York, Los Angeles, London, Brussels, Madrid, Barcelona, Mexico, Stockholm, Copenhagen, Oslo, Moscow, and Hong Kong. 2004 was a banner year for this entrepreneurial designer. She, um, in 2004, Kim Parker Home Bedding and Bath Collections launched from Bloomingdale's. In publishing, Kim has licensing agreements with Galison and Graphique de France for her calendar and stationery ranges, and with Editions Limited for her wall art collection. This spring, in 2008, the designer's first book on art and design, titled Kim Parker Home, A Life in Design, will be published by Harry and Abrams, and that is a fait accompli that has happened. Um, in February 2006, Scholastic Media launched the, the designer's new children's label, Kim Parker Kids, which includes a line of educational plush toys, backpacks, hand puppets, giftware, and wall art based on her children's book, Counting in the Garden. Her work has appeared in the following publications, and this is a long list, so I'm going to truncate it just <laughs> for the interest of time, because we only have an hour, and um, I'm going to stop before I get to the end of the list. Vogue UK, House and Garden UK, L Decoration UK, Vogue Living Australia, The World of Interiors, which is also Brit, um, British Homes and Gardens, L, WWD, L Decor, The London Guardian, The Good Old New York Times, Country Living, Grazia and Casa de Abitare, Italy, Architectural Digest, Germany and France, Metropolitan Home, Martha Stewart Weddings, the Martha Stewart Weddings, The Observer, which is also UK, The Independent, um, Southern Accents, Hamptons, Veranda, Oprah, Traditional Home, U, which is also UK, Interior Design, Home, Bazaar, Metropolis, House Beautiful, Western Interiors and Design, and the list does go on, including uh, LA, Newsday, et cetera. It's a very um, extraordinary list of publications in which to appear. Um, Kim made her television debut in August 2004 as a featured designer on the Fine Living Network, her lifestyle series, S Sheila Bridges Designer Living. The segment, Design Feature, Episode 309, focuses on Kim Parker's life in design. Um, and there's some other television credits, which you can certainly find if you're interested on the Kim Parker website. Um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce, and I hope we'll have a warm FIT welcome, uh, this is Kim Parker.
I'm delighted you're here with us. Thank you, John. Truly. Thanks for inviting me. Truly. No, it's a pleasure. I'd like to um, kind of lead off by congratulating you on the publication of the book. Thank you. Which I read with great interest. And um, I have to say, uh, I think it's, I, 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 the first question I, I had was really why now? Why a book at this stage of your career? Because you seem to be not nearly at peak. Uh, okay. And it's not, it, it has a retrospective quality in a certain way, but it's, it's very much, in, you're still in the very midst of your career. So why now? Well, I have a lot of collections for the home that are, you know, fun to do uh, interior decorating with, such as dinnerware and rugs and deck pillows and wall art and that kind of thing. So the idea of having interior shots, you know, in all different kinds of, you know, beautiful rooms really inspired me because uh, I've, always been, I've always been inspired by painters such as Bonnard and Vuillard and Matisse and, you know, looking at all those lush interiors with all those beautiful overlay of patterns. Uh, that was one reason that I was inspired to do it. But I also have lived in New York, um, in the city for about 20 years now. And the city has, you know, given me a lot of inspiration as a textile designer. I've want, I've, I'm a frequenter at the flea market on the weekends. And our entire living room and apartment are furnished with things that put, couldn't possibly uh, not one piece of furniture exceeded $500, I don't think. Um, but, you know, I, New York being as colorful it is, as it is with flower markets and flea markets and, and, you know, parks filled with beautiful flowers, I felt inspired to put together in a book my design aesthetic, which is largely floral, as you can see, um, through the eyes of my love for New York, my love for color, and, you know, to encompass all of that, you know, with painting and textile and home interior design in one book. So I felt it was a good project and it took about two and a half years to complete. And are you satisfied with the result, basically? Very much so, yes. I, really I know you had some battles uh, editorially and visually. Right. Um, but it's not, it wasn't, it's not the typical interior design book that you might find on the shelves at the Strand or the, you know, or Barnes & Noble. I had been offered book deals from, you know, big kahunas out there like the Judith Regans and the Rizzolis who said, you know, we'd love to do a book with you two years ago um, saying, you know, we'd like it to be a how to decorate book and I'm really not interested in telling people how to hang a curtain. That's not what I do. Um, I'm, I was more interested in actually, really, the text being a reflection of my journey through the fashion industry and um, coming out of college with a music degree, not any design degree, and taking a, a big leap away from a promising career in music to um, stepping my foot into the fashion industry where I didn't have any experience and what that meant to me um, artistically, creatively, and to chronicle that journey, that really hard and difficult journey where I was fired a million times from jobs and, and but got a great deal of education from you know couture companies who hired me down to you know diaper bag companies. I mean really it just the the spectrum was there. So um, well we in conversations before today uh, Kim and I exchanged war stories about uh, <laughs> bosses from hell and the, all of the experiences that can happen to you as you're, as you're moving through your career. Uh, but I, I was also struck by the fact that you had some couture clients who were extraordinarily generous to you as well. So I don't want to frighten the audience. Uh, people like Diane von Furstenberg. Very uh, lovely. You know, really lovely and they really got you. But this was like at a slightly later stage. I was very struck in reading this by the fact that you, you really use some of those short-lived um, experiences because you are very self-taught, mm -hmm. you know, and on the job taught. Right. Um, and also you, you've taken a, a course or two here in, in painting on silk. And uh, also you had one, I thought, very generous uh, colleague who took the time and you took the time to learn how to paint on silk. Right. Well, there were a number of people, including one in this audience whom I'm looking directly at, Eileen Mislove, 
Um, she was one of the first uh, people that I ever encountered in, in the textile design industry. She was partnered with uh, Barbara Groot, and they had their own design studio. And a friend of mine led me in the direction. Um, I was still having somewhat of a flute career at that point, and it was a transitional point very early on before any of this started, but it was in this studio that Eileen and, and Barbara had that um, I was introduced to how to put a ground down first before yes. painting a textile. And, which was really big news for me, you know, because I painstakingly went around every single motif before that um, to create designs. And, and I learned a lot in that first job experience, especially as, you know, uh, both Barbara and Eileen were ext are extraordinary artists, and I gained a lot of visual information from both being a part of that studio where silk and, pa and paper were both, um, you know, sold. and, and and that was pretty much like the first, you know, uh, spot in the fashion industry. And after that, I, I went for nine to five jobs and I put myself out there in different studios and, and, you know, from children's wear to bridge market fashion studios to everything you can, for echo scarves and, you know, I, I pretty much in converters. I worked everywhere and, and pretty much got fired from every job I had too. <laughs> because I just couldn't, there were a lot of reasons that I was uncomfortable with the industry, mainly because I really held very closely to my voice and, and ha because I didn't come from a design mm. background, I was a music major in college and had painted since I was three, um, you know, a lot of the studios didn't understand my, what my fortes were and they'd push me in the corner and say paint Hermes or repaint an Hermes design with these incredible scrolls and diamonds and faux jewels and it just wasn't my voice or my hand and you know with a pack of Rolades in my back pocket um, I got myself through you know the first four months and, and was sacked but each time I went along I learned a lot about the industry which you know I, I whether it was color or how things were marketed um, and I really got an on-the-job education, not only with techniques and painting, but also in terms of what the market expected and mm. different levels from children's wear to, you know, to, um, you know, couture. Well, you seem to use those experiences, whether they were negative or really negative or positive, <laughs> just as opportunities to keep moving. And your tenacity is, I think, fairly remarkable. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was struck by it over and over again in, in, in the book that um, no matter what negativity happened uh, career-wise, you were able to just by, I think, strength of character or sheer professional tenacity, use it as an opportunity to learn from it and move on. You don't seem to be crushable, hmm. which is great, I think, experience for some designers to know about, you know, student designers and people who are going to be in this business. Uh, what's, what's, the, what's the modus operandi? Passion. It's, you know, if you love what you do, if you, you know, I, I would wake up between, everything I did I had a paintbrush in my hand, because I, I just love to paint, and I, it's, no one could take that away from me, even though they tried over and over and over to change my hand, to change my voice. You know, I think that if you're passionate and you, and you hold true to what you believe is your in individual and unique voice as an artist, and yes, go around, get your industry experience, but don't let anybody for too long try to mold you into something that you're uncomfortable with. You know, it's okay to move on. You don't have to stay and be tortured, you know. <laughs> um, and there's a, there's always money to make in the next job, you know. And it, it they'll always. I, I'm a, I'm sort of a fatal optimist in that way. I I, I enjoy. I really enjoyed being fired. I, uh, most of the time. <laughs> and uh, I don't really know what well, I owe I to. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> it's you know, it's very tough on the ego to be told for whatever reason. You know, particularly for a company where you feel like you're almost superior to them, <laughs> that your services are no longer required. So I, I really, um, I applaud you for that, for being a, an unquenchable spirit. Oh, I was like the fiddler on the roof when I got it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 